Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's been a beautiful and busy week mm -hmm. because it's it's May. <laughs> it's been a great May though, like not too hot. Yeah. We've been getting warm enough for things to grow, but like in the 80s, yeah, you know, like doable. low 80s. But storms, you know, every night instead of like the once a week storms we're used to. Yeah. Like we have big cloud, like big storm clouds rolling every night. And I'm like, oh, we had reports the other night. I got a text from my neighbor and she said, my daughter is in Vail right now and they're getting quarter size hail 20 miles away from us and it's moving our direction. And I, I knew the next day I was having some people over to the house. <laughs> Like, please, this happens every time I want to show people the garden, sure. the hostas get shredded or, yeah. you know, something like that. But we've been able to, uh, to... They kind of just like skirted around. All the storms have, I mean, yeah. it's got a little windy, but no hail or anything yeah, like that. They just kind of skirt around and move on. Gotten lucky. So anyway, it's just, it's crazy too that there's so many things on my list, but I don't feel like that... Pressure. The pressure to get any of it done. It's like, well, just do what we can, you know? Yeah. We do a lot every single day and yeah. you just do what you can until your body says, nope. <laughs> uh, and speaking of, this this week's recap video is sponsored by Nature's Willow, which, you know, they- If your body says, nope, get a pain patch. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, the last time they sponsored a recap, you guys like blew it out of the park. Yeah. Crazy how many of you guys ordered this stuff and reported back like so many good you know that was what surprised me a little bit like you know when you have something like i don't use them personally but you know I you do. do and my mom does my mom is the one who introduced me to their but like stuff. you know it's sort of anecdotal because like it works for you but it's like you know it doesn't not everything works for everybody but uh -huh. i was kind of surprised how people were just like whoa thank you for introducing yeah. yeah so if you guys aren't aware of nature's willow company that specializes in pain management like pain patches pain cream, um, like a bath soak, there's some bug bite balm, that sort of thing with all natural product or all natural ingredients like helichrysum and um, trying to remember all the things. There's there's lots of different things in um, like natural ingredients in the product. But anyway, uh, if any of you guys need to re-up on your pain patches, they are offering 20% off. Yeah. With the code, code Laura, Laura 20. 20. Anyway, they're going to um, throw in some like pain cream samples and a few pain patches in every order as well. So you get a little And you don't bone. have to do anything. They just, right, they they'll just, just throw that use in. the code and they'll just show up in your order. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you, Nature's Willow, for sponsoring today's video again. So we're going to jump right into the videos from last week. May Garden Tour 2.0 was the first one. And we had done a tour like two days before that. It was two evenings before that. Yeah. And things changed so wildly that we were... We don't ever do that. Yeah. Or we're like, well, another, time for another tour two right. days later. But it's like all of the lilacs opened, all of the tulips started to color up and it was just, everything just came alive and it was worth seeing. And I'm glad, I'm glad we did it because I feel like that was the best overall on bulbs that we maybe have ever done. Yeah. I don't know. We had one good year, like maybe three years ago really? where a lot of the bulbs were open all at the same time. Yeah. That's incredibly hard to do, especially when you have springs like we typically do. We typically get a really early spring in February and it gets warm. People are out planting and then it gets super cold again, kills everything we just planted and mm -hmm. we have to do it again in May. Uh, but th that messes up your bulb cycle. You know, a lot of them will bloom a lot earlier, but this year, since it was so cold, we had a lot of dafts blooming at the same time. A lot of our tulips were blooming and like, I don't know if we're going to see that again, like the yeah. Luca gems blooming, blooming as much as they were at the same time that all the mentons are blooming, the tulips, who the knows? The mentons are still blooming. Yeah. Like getting toward the end, the end of May. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, that was the video. Uh, Joe Joette said, ah, tour 2.0 was great. Loved all the new color and excitement you have for your garden. Question. What is the skeleton like bushes at about 1544 on the right side? I'm in the northern plains and, and to see such color now is wonderful as we are just seeing everything green up now. Those are tiger eyes sumacs. They grow kind of like wonky mm -hmm. like that. They've got a really interesting shape. The good thing about this variety of sumac is that they top out at six feet and a lot of the other ones grow 10, 12 feet um, and just about that wide. And these, I don't know how wide those are, maybe six to eight feet mm -hmm. at the, this point. They, also, they do spread. Sumacs are notorious for that, but not as bad and as fast as the older varieties do. So just this year, this is their third season in the ground. I'm noticing a few mm -hmm. pop up around, but they're easy to manage. They're easy to pull. So I don't mind things that do. And I kind of want them to spread a little bit because, I, I mean, the fall color on these is probably one of the most stunning things in our entire garden. Yeah, In terms of fall color. Incredible. I mean, they're... So I kind of want them to naturalize a bit, but I don't mind things that, that do naturalize so long as they're not a total beast to pull out of the ground. 
Right. If they're easy to pull out, who cares? Like, just go out and weed them. Like, they're weeds that are coming up anyway. Just add them to the list, you know? Uh, You don't want it to naturalize like morning glory. Yeah, no. Thank you. E.N. said, admit it, Laura. You walk around with catnip in your pocket. Russell's like a magnet. I don't, but Russell is... He's like a needy cat. Yeah. He like needs... He just wants the loves. He wants the loves all the time. Uh, can you show us what's in the cold frames of the Hartley? I saw something that looked like ranunculus. I did plant some ranunculus that I had started in the greenhouse early. They colored up and, and bloomed a bit, but it got so hot in there so fast that uh, in ranunculus, like on the cool side, that they, uh, they like started to fry up mm. pretty fast. They looked pretty crummy for most of the time that they were in there, except for the very beginning when they were all nice and green and it was still cool enough to where I was col- uh, closing the lids at night. And then, yeah, so now they're empty, and I'm thinking, what can I plant in there for summer? Do I just leave them empty? I mean, they're on the south side of the Hartley. There's no reprieve from sun. It's going to be hot, Mm -hmm. like real hot. And there's water. We have the drip system set up in there, so there is that. But what do I plant? I need suggestions, you guys. Something that's not, that's annual. Like, I have some leftover zinnia starts, and I've got some leftover other seedlings, but I don't even know... I don't know. I want to be careful about what I put in there so we don't have to run the drips twice a day. Yeah. You know? Beth said, will you keep the tulip bulbs in the pots by the Hartley and just plant over them for summer? Yeah, probably. Yeah, may as well. Things like that, though, um, I was just talking with some of my friends last night. We were walking around the garden, and I was like, here's the, here's the quandary. Like in Versailles, all those beautiful tulips around the boxwoods. Do I leave those in the ground knowing that they are not going to come up like they did this year? Tulips are just notorious for that. They're not, you can't rely on them as being a consistent sort of show. Like they'll come up, some of them, but not like they did this year. So do I pull them up and kind of treat them as annuals? They, I can always find homes for them. I never have a problem with that. So they'll be planted somewhere else. And they were like, pull them. Mm. pull them like just if you have those specific annual areas that you want big show then you know and maybe you want something different in there a different color the next year so I think I might and in those pots maybe I'll do the same thing that arrangement though I was really like questioning it when I when I was putting it in and I loved it Mm. it was so pretty oh they were blushing lady and Johan Kruf 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 so, uh, f- soccer player, right? Like a famous one mm. in Europe. Is yeah. that what they're named after? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. I didn't know that. Sunshine and Flora said, what are the variety of white flowers that you have blooming that you mentioned are like large snowdrops? Uh, I'm wondering if they would make a good cut flower to mix with tulips. They are an amazing cut flower. They last for a really long time. They are called leucogems. It's L-E-U-C-O-J-U-M. Maybe we can put that on the screen. A summer snowflake is the common name. I got mine from Color Blends, and I try to add some every year because I just, I love them. They're so gorgeous. They're like, they're magical. They're like giant fairy flowers. Jennifer said, have you ever made a water feature for pollinators so they don't drown? can't say that I've like, like when we put the bird bath in mm-hmm. at Alyssa's, I put rocks in there so like butterflies and bees could land and not drown on the water. But in terms of like fountains and things, they, they chill on the edge. Yeah. Like a lot of times, a lot of our fountains have something that the water is spilling over and you'll see them chilling on the edge drinking. I remember watching that from my office, my seat down at the garden center when I was like doing stuff down there. And there was a fountain placed right outside my window, and I could watch bees land Mm. and drink. That was pretty fun. Paradescent said, everything's looking beautiful. Thank you. You've mentioned chelated iron a number of times in various videos, and I think it's something my variegated maple tree could use because the leaves always fry and don't grow their full size. Where do you get the chelated iron from? It's not a specific product that comes up uh, with an internet search. Is a spoma's iron tone the same thing? It is not. Uh, uh, Iron tone is good, but it's um, a lot... It's not like a quick If you have shot. lower pH, yeah, I think iron tone would be good as something that you stay on. Yeah. It's a consistency thing Yeah, to keep that up. But the chelated iron we use, do you remember what brand it is? Uh, I think like Fertilome sells it. Yeah. Um, there's another brand. I, yeah, I don't know what the name It comes in like a yellow Canister. tubular can, yeah, yeah. bottle kind it's of a thing. It's the same brand. You get it in a bag too. Mm-hmm. 
but it's EDDHA. There's also an EDDTA, but that's not the one we use. It's EDDHA. That's the one specifically for high pH soils that helps with the chlorosis problem. But it's definitely worth a try because that is a telltale sign. It's hard to tell probably in a variegated maple, you know, if you have the dark veining and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the yellowing leaves, if it's already variegated. Uh, but when your leaves start to fry, that's what happens to severe problems in our area. Severe chlorosis equals you know, yellowing leaves and fried tips in the end. Rosa said, could you please tell me who did you order your tulips from? Color blends last four, five years. Yeah. Great quality. I think really good prices. I've been around, I guess, looking at bulbs long enough. For, I feel like you could get a lot for a good price and they're good quality. Good selection too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been really happy. Dana said, love the lilacs. Mine is definitely becoming a second story lilac. I can only see blooms from my upstairs window. If I give it a rejuvenation prune and cut it down to the ground, should it grow back? So I don't want to say like, yes, it will, <laughs> but it probably will. I mean, a good rejuvenation prune after it's done blooming, I wouldn't expect blooms maybe next year or very few. It might take it a couple of years to recover from a prune like that, but it definitely would make your blooms lower for a little while for sure. Or you could take it out and put in a lilac that stays smaller. That's a, another solution. Then you won't have to worry about, about pruning it at all. I totally, uh, so when I was, I was ordering some food the other night and I was asking because we had a group of people here and I was asking, okay, so like how many of these do you usually do average per person? And she's like, I don't want to say. I'm like, well, why can't you say? She's like, well, but if you run out, I don't want you to be mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally understand that answer because right. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to answer this because if you do it and it doesn't work, yeah, oh, I don't, don't come back to me. Yeah. Uh, next video was planting out beautiful perennials, Samantha lilies, Agastache, and Brunera. Um, so yeah, I had some Samantha oriental lilies that somebody sent out. There was no information on the packaging though. So thank you, whoever sent me those, they're real pretty. Popped those in the ground. Um, Agastache was a second time. It, we pronounce it Agastache. It could be Agastache or um, Hyssop, Anna's Hyssop, I think, right? Anyway, just wanna clear that up right now before mm. I see all the comments. Um, I planted the meant to be Queen Nectarine planted them last year most of them died I've heard that that's happening I also planted the royal raspberry all of them died twice I've tried mm. them twice and so I don't know if I'm going to put those back in but the queen nectarine are so gorgeous and they were in such beautiful bloom I thought well let's just put these out here I'll kind of assess what's going on see if they're like staying too wet but that didn't see like seem like the soil was doing anything I have I have several other varieties of agastache out in the garden like probably four or five and they're all beautiful right mm. now so I don't know what the deal is there. So I want to give it another try because it's so pretty. And then we planted a bunch of the Queen of Hearts Brunnera. So pretty. I don't know why we didn't plant those there before. I mean, <laughs> well, they're like the like, perfect uh, thing. I looked in that area. You've done pretty things in that little, you know, section before. It's a hard one though, because I, I explained the um, grass sprinkler in order to hit where the grass kind of swoops back into the flower bed, it oversprays the front part of that flower bed. So everything I put in there, it has to handle quite a lot of of water, mm -hmm. um, but also the hard water, the overspray, the hard water, it's perfect. The Brunnera is already white. Yeah. <laughs> it's like silver variegation. So we won't probably notice any hard water spotting like I've noticed on other things in the past. Majestical Cat said, I planted zone 9A. So if I plant Brunnera, that, then will it not survive? No, it won't. Because uh, Brunnera is a zone, this one was a zone three through eight. If you're in a zone nine, it just doesn't get cold enough. Some plants need a cold period in order to rest and be productive the next season. Um, so unfortunately, there might be a variety of Brunnera out there that goes up to a zone nine. I, I would have to look it up and, and see, but this one unfortunately would not love your area. Uh, I love this part of the garden so much. Is that a viburnum uh, Berkwood eye? Like a mohawk viburnum, I think. I don't know what it is. There's, there's a viburnum sort of in the area where the Brunnera went that blooms beautifully every spring. It was here when we moved in, so that's why I can't tell you exactly what it is. It would kind of maybe make sense because the leaves are semi-evergreen. It keeps most of its leaves through the winter, but it's kind of like a hellebore in that if we have a colder winter, they look pretty crummy and like need to push new ones. Uh, but very highly scented, and I don't know if the mohawk smells very good. Mm. Variety. This one smells good. So there are other varieties of evergreen viburnum out there. I just, I think it's real pretty. Lori said, do you keep a log slash map of what you plant where, or do you remember year after year? We uh -huh. do. 
Do you? Yeah, we have a log. Videos. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to find stuff, though. Because there's you know, some videos where I've done like five yeah. things and it's something's buried. If you know the name of something, you can go to YouTube, type in Garden Answer, Anna's Hyssop, or, you know, whatever. And it'll bring up that. <laughs> it'll yeah. bring up that video. It'll uh -huh. bring up all the videos of, because the keywords, you know. Oh, gotcha. So, but if you don't know what it's called, it is tougher to remember. But, I mean. I remember what a lot of things are called, but I don't yeah. remember some of them. You know, I kind of. Oftentimes we'll remember like the time of year that something got planted mm -hmm. and we, we have playlists and I use that a lot going back to playlists. Like, I, you know, I think it was 2019. So it's like in the spring of 2019, you just go check, mm -hmm. you know, all those videos. You can usually find it. Sure. Brooke said, I love my Brunera. Do you know when it gets older, can it be divided like hostas? Yes, it can be. Uh, they also will seed themselves around a little bit, not horribly bad, like just the right amount. Mm. And they're so cute. Those little seedlings. I had a hedge of the Queen of Hearts behind the pondless water feature when we still had like the full on pergola back there. And uh, two of them are still there. Like I missed them somehow. I moved the other ones and there's still two that lived all summer last year, like hundred plus degree temperatures, full sun. They did beautifully. And now there's like babies all around them this spring. Mm. I love it. Chantel said, I would love to know why Hookera performs like it does. Why does it diminish each year? And also why did the Budlia die back this year? I have no idea. I have no idea. We've had quite a bit of loss in our garden this year. I've already pulled quite a bit of it, but like I planted um, four purple haze butterfly bushes. Every single one of them died. They did beautifully in the garden last year. They had uh, apparently the right amount of water. I mean, they were in the ground. That's what's so odd is how well they performed during yeah. the summer, during like and the heat and everything. And yeah, yeah. They just didn't make it through the winter. Right. A blue meringue lilac, dead. Well, it's got like one branch that's alive. Um, a um, Brandywine Viburnum, dead. A three-year-old Rose of Sharon pillar, white pillar, dead. Like, I don't, I don't know. And then a lot of our other Budleas, I planted a drift of Miss Violets, a drift of microchip pinks, a drift of, uh, I can't even remember. Some of those I lost and some of them died all the way back to the ground. Is it possible that we've got like gophers or no. moles or mm -hmm. voles? They're out rooted. Of them? Like that's a weird thing. I could barely pull them out. Like they rooted in, huh. and they performed beautifully last year. And some of them were two, three years old. Yeah. Are the things that we lost. That's frustrating. It is frustrating, and there's really not a lot. I don't know why that happened. Um, there are some years. Budley is. I kind of expect them to die back to the ground because it happens like probably fifty percent of the time. They grow so fast that it doesn't matter. So I just cut all the top growth off that's dead and let them flush back. But the Rose of Sharon thing is weird. Mm -hmm. We don't lose Rose of Sharons, so I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, those are pretty hardy. Yeah, I lost I think four Rose of Sharons last year or this this winter, and then. Um, the hookera just has never really performed here. There are certain varieties like spearmint. Um, you had yeah. a black variety that hung out quite a while black on the west side. It's still there. Black pearl. Yeah. Kind of discolors a little bit. Yeah. Um, but they're just, my dad, he calls them annuals. Like, oh, you're planting more annual hookeras, huh? You know, like we really a, should just plan oh, on them being annuals if we plant any. That's a, that's a commitment of an annual right there. I yeah. mean, just plant a coleus, right? That's way less expensive than a hookera. Sure. I don't know. They, they are That's really true. pretty. And sometimes the reason why I keep planting them is that sometimes you land on a variety or a spot where it works. Mm -hmm. And then it's awesome. But it's rare. It is m more or less rare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next video is planting a huge drift of Superbena, sparkling amethyst. It's so pretty. I almost don't want it to grow because it looks so like uniform and so gorgeous out there. I love it. And then we also planted the urns on our west side, which are also really pretty, like purples and whites. It's just, I'm loving it. It was, uh, I saw a lot of comments, maybe they're included about, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time this morning. And then you proceed to plant like 300 plants. <laughs> Well, that took me, what, 10 minutes? Yeah, it didn't Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't take, take long. very long. It doesn't. You have the right tools and then you just zip, zip, zip. It's all about efficiency. And that's what I'm about now, yeah. these days. I don't want to bend over in the garden a million times to plant something. That's why I never use shorter augers, ever. I have a 36 inch auger, a four inch and a two inch. And I can, most of the time, um, I mean, I can bend over like and place things on the ground or I can just toss them. A lot of times I'll just toss the plant 
in the can, toss it on the ground and go through and you zip all the holes, go through with all your fertilizer. And then the only time you actually have to bend over is to plant your plant in the ground. And that, yeah. I have a friend that plants like squat in squat position, like all squatting all the way down, but not putting her knees on the ground. I'm like, how do you do that? Like flat footed, like the Asian squat? I don't, I don't know. I haven't like looked at the form. I just look at it and know that I would be so sore if I did that. Like I wallow around in the ground and I do stuff to make it the least impact on my body. Cause I just do it so much. So like I'm full on knees all the way to my ankles on the ground. Hmm. And then I just kind of crawl around on the ground and get everything planted. And then I get back, <laughs> get back up. So it might have taken between 10 and 15 minutes to get all of this done in reality, but it was pretty fast. Kylie said, I recently planted some small baby gem boxwoods. With the heavy rains we've had this spring, they have a few splaying branches, much like your arbs. Would my boxwoods benefit from being tied up or is it more of a pruning issue? With boxwoods in the past, it's kind of pruning. I don't know that I would tie up box, I mean, that would take, it depends on how many you have, but that would take quite a long time. But the whole thought in tying these branches up is to let the wood harden in that position instead of hardening uh, in a more splayed out position, if that makes sense. Sometimes I can tuck those branches in the boxwoods back in, um, and sometimes I'll just cut them off, and that way it just encourages more growth inside the plant. Rose said, can you show us what your husband did to the arborvitaes at the end of the video? He was moving too fast for me to catch on. Oh, yeah. Just, okay. So I was using tree rope by DeWitt. DeWitt. Mm -hmm. And I was just like either wrapping them because if there were too many that were splayed out, too many branches splayed, I literally was just wrapping around the whole thing and tying it up like a bow. Um, or I was tying an individual branch. And then I actually cut my hands quite a bit trying to reach in to mm -hmm. the uh, arbs. But I would just try to wrap around a couple of the most prominent branches and just kind of like bring in the one mm -hmm. so um i don't know if that's like a long-term solution or i don't know if wrapping them is is good well it was either that or prune the heck out of them yeah, and hope and they recover i just yeah pruning them didn't seem like an option because you'd lose like half your mm -hmm. arb so well like i don't i can't say that it's like the way to do it or like i recommend it but that's what i'm doing I would like it to go down in the record that I thought we should plant junipers there, <laughs> not ours. Yeah. Well, the junipers would have taken up a lot more space. The west oh, side not would... much. Like maybe a foot. Maybe really? a foot more. Well, Take way less how water. tall would junipers get? Which ones did you want? Spartans. Well, green. Oh, nice they get green. about the same, don't yeah. they? About the like same 15? as North Poles. Yeah. They cap out around 15. 15. The difference, like North Pole's three to five feet wide and Spartans are five to six feet wide. So in the end, the mature size we're going for is the five foot side of things. So right. we would have a nice, beautiful hedge. Yeah. But yeah, Spartan junipers maybe would have been a better decision. I don't know. I, the arbs do smell nice. They do smell nice. They, um, and they're softer, way softer. Yeah, and they're softer. But they softer. do require a lot more water. Mm-hmm. And they can't, they're, they're weaker. Yeah, they're definitely weak. Mm-hmm. I mean, they just have lots of branches that grow straight up. Yeah. So it's just a natural. And I wonder if maybe they've just like grown too quickly and they haven't hardened. I'm really, what I'm hoping is that by tying them up, they'll just harden, you know, in yeah. a vertical Fashion. And they might just do that and we don't have a problem anymore. Yeah, and then we could just like cut the rope at one point, yeah. you know, once, I don't know. After you did we'll that, they look it. beautiful. They, they look do. a lot better. They look so much better. Um, and they have grown really fast. But we've got like 120 arbs on the new yeah. property, you know, Yeah. which I'm really excited for those to grow because those will block off the subdivision, a lot of the, the homes that are built there. Um, and I think that that will kind of like just separate our garden a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason everybody plants a hedge what do they say? Like it's just fences make good neighbors. Yeah, we've got we have good, good neighbors. We've got good neighbors, like. But it's still. I nice. want to like cut a hole so I can still say hi to Marilyn. Yeah. <laughs> like hey Marilyn, <laughs> cut a hole in the hedge. But um, like I enjoy talking with them when yeah. they're outside. But but you know plants do are good for privacy and just you know keeping a distinction between properties. I just like it for the green backdrop. Mm -hmm. It just provides like a just a solid something yeah. instead of like you know your eye fighting. It does create just a very peaceful, calming backdrop. Yeah. Lynette said, <clears throat> what is the landscape compost slash mulch blend you use? I called our local landscaping company and they said they offer only leaf compost in bulk. Really? Can you please help me know what I should be asking for? Said, um, yeah. 
you like this is just uh they call it forested compost so it's just trees that have been composting and it's pretty fine you know mm -hmm. like we don't prefer like barky mm -hmm. mulch we prefer more fine mm -hmm. so that's kind of what you're looking for you just you know it like we've talked about this before it took us years to find one that we liked that didn't gray out yeah and look super dry so you mm -hmm. probably just need to go around to as many you know yards as you can mm -hmm. just look over all the you know take home maybe a little bit of samples i'm sure they'll give you some samples mm -hmm. um and just just look at you, know, you might try a couple and you don't like them and you got to try something else yeah we did yep i mean we used big old wood chips one year because yeah. they were free <laughs> you know yeah, right honestly yeah. they the soil out there is improving it, it really is. really is yeah uh, Janice said, how do you decide on slow release fertilizer or weekly liquid? We do both. <laughs> we do both just in case, because you know, those plants, they are big users of, of nutrients because they are fast growers and they're productive um, and you got to feed them as such. So we do the slow release because it's a, just a really good backup. There's an inevitable week where we'll, we will miss fertilizing because we just got too busy or whatever the case may be. Um, and it's just nice to have something in there so the plants have something to lean on. Right now, Tuesday is our fertilizing day. Tuesday. Tuesday fertilizing day. Carrie said, do you have any videos or advice about keeping weeds out of your beds? I'm trying to slowly expand my backyard beds to eventually wrap around my entire backyard along the fence. But I've only finished about a quarter of it and I'm already losing the battle with weeds. I can't imagine the weeds I'll have when the expansion is all done. We have put down fabric, but it only seems to help a little. Yeah, fabric doesn't really do... A whole lot. We don't use fabric in our beds as a rule. We only have used it in areas where we had bindweed problems, which suppression is the only way to get rid of it without spraying the heck out of it. And we can't do that because there's plants all over the place that would die as well. Um, so <sighs> advice on it just, you got to just get out there and take care of them. I mean, you got to section that stuff up, like just tackle a little bit every day. And I think that that's what helped me when I was managing the garden all by myself before we had Paul and Bethany's help. I had to zone it and just know that today's day, this is the area that I'm gonna be working on. And there is a moment in the spring when everything booms where you feel like it's gonna beat you. Mm -hmm. But if you at least like get what you can get done in that zone and move on to the next ones, you know, for the rest of the week and you will eventually get on top of it. You might get a little bit behind, but, um, yeah, I, that's the only advice I can give. Other than um, we have used, in terms of sprays, we don't spray in our flower beds, but um, we have used the deadweed brew in our gravel areas and walkways, um, mixed at the highest ratio. And then we've also used the lawnweed brew to kill broadleafs in our grass. And those are both for organic gardening. And um, they've worked really well for us. So in flower beds, we just hand pull. Uh, we use hula hose a lot, which I used to be completely against. Like I wanted them hand pulled. I don't want any, like any hint that there was a weed here. I don't want to see weeds on top of the soil surface. Now I don't care. Like that weed will be wilted and you won't even see it by tomorrow. And right. if you can keep weeding standing up, it really is better on your body. And the hula ho is kind of like Bethany and Paul's tool of choice. And I've started to use it and I like it quite a bit. I like it better than the weed It's funny how you come around to things. Yeah, it just takes me a while. Like yeah. I have to try things out and really like make sure it works works for me. Everybody's different. And I feel what like they one like of the biggest use. things that you had to come around to was the hose links. Yeah, and you now were like, like I don't know how sure. we would do it. Yeah, and there are areas like our raised bed vegetable garden where we don't have one. I really actually would like to have one in there, but I can't think of a spot where it makes sense. Yeah, because you can't pull it out. That's the one thing about hose link is that you have to have space to pull it out straight. Right. Um, so that if, so you don't rake over plants mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I mean, the only place I could put it is on an, on the Arbor, like right, right on an Arbor, but I don't want to do that. Well, you know, what if we got one of those hook things that, uh, Ely hose reels sells? I still feel like, like the thing on the corner of the barn that we had that one time you could stick your hose through it and no, it's a little different. No? It's, it's oh. a hook and that has, uh, wheels, like wheels on it. Yeah. So you just hook the hook yeah. and then pull, but it's not a. Like the one that we had before. I don't know that it would pull out. The hose links, you have to have a little strength to pull out the hose. And yeah. I think if you have to turn a corner, I don't think you'll get the right. I think you'd have to pull what the heck out of it. I tried it. And then if you didn't like it, we took it out. Not in the vegetable garden. See, I just don't want anything to mess up the roses. And those arbors are old. Oh, and not I'm, on the arbor. You keep it in the same spot because you do the hook. 
on to, what? Uh, well, it's in the ground. That's what. That's the whole point of oh, it. Oh, I was thinking a hook like attached to something. No. Like screwed into a wall somewhere. Yeah. Okay. You put it. You put it in the ground. Sure. So you probably put it near the arbor. Yeah. So you'd hook that right. right on the other side of the arbor and then pull out down the main path. Yeah. If that would work, that would be awesome. And that way, it's not. I'm just worried that if we attach it to the arbor, that the arbor would just pull yeah, right no, over. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. But yeah, the the hook that I'm talking about, the Ely one, it's Is meant to go in the ground. I remember it's like a that spike. now. Yeah. Irene said, "What does Samantha do when you walk by the tulips? Does she ever want to just pick them?" Um, no. I, she doesn't mess with stuff out in the garden, no, really. No, she really doesn't. She she messes with potted stuff, though. Dirt. Yeah, she messes with dirt. She loves the dirt. Oh, man. It just makes her happy it does. to be dirty. And I love it. Because like I'll take a, a gator load of starts out to the cut flower garden, and I'll take Samantha with me, and I give her a trowel. And I like, plop her down on the ground, and she just digs and digs and fills her shoes up with soil. And she's just covered, but she's quiet the entire time. I actually look up several times just to make sure she's still sitting there. She doesn't move. She just like plays in that dirt until I'm done. It's pretty awesome. But there was a moment this winter where she was just, ooh, it was like right, right when I was starting to get ranunculus in, I had a flat on the ground. I couldn't fit them on the tables. And she would sneak one of those and go hide in the greenhouse and dismember the whole thing. Pop all the buds off and then she would like peel them apart. I could see how that would be like real satisfying mm -hmm. to do. <sighs> she got after a couple of them and then she got into a little bit of trouble. So she didn't do that anymore. <laughs> Katie said, what do you use to spray super tunias with to treat for budworms? Um, there's two different things. I have neem oil, but I don't know. Don't use, I wouldn't use neem oil for budworms. I um, use either BT. The, the wonderful thing about BT, it's a Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacterial nat naturally found in the soil. It targets caterpillars, not like honeybees or anything like that. And the caterpillar has to ingest it in order for it to kill it. Um, so you're not hurting other flying pollinators around, which that's so nice to know. Because, I mean, you're spraying flowers. You could be a little more liberal with BT than with, yeah, with Captain Jack's, Captain Jack's. bug brew. The nice thing about Captain Jack's dead bug um, is a spinosad. It's also an organic spray, um, but it's still a pesticide. Um, it, it does kill more than just the caterpillars. It'll take care of the budworms, but it will also take care of aphids. And I know aphids are a huge problem on petunias sometimes. So if you're trying to like kill two birds with one stone, um, that would be a good one to use. But if you're wanting something that's like the safest possible choice, BT is the best. What bird is making that noise out there? It's a... Like magpies? Yeah, magpie. Oh, my goodness. Um, Jolt said, it's a bummer to see how difficult the arbs have been. The green wall is a fabulous idea, but do you think you would have chosen another plant in hindsight? Just discussed that. I personally would have. Just because working down at the garden center, you see how many people are replacing arbs and sure. bringing arbs back. And, uh, you know, but these have performed better than probably any other hedge of arbs I've seen in our area. There are a few like glorious looking hedges, but yeah. these have done pretty well. And being tied up, they, they, they went good. back to looking pretty good. Yeah. So I'm just hopeful that tying them up doesn't harm them. Gardening Grandma said, do you have a source for the tree rope that you can share? You just ordered it online, didn't you? No, I got it from Andrews. Oh, um, we couldn't find it, it online, uh, right? Yeah, it's tough. It's made by DeWitt, the people that make like the The, uh, the good landscape kind fabric. of landscape fabric. If you're going to use landscape fabric, DeWitt Pro is the only kind I would ever use. I will try. I mean, it's just like a nylon, um, right? It's, it's just a very soft twine. Yeah, it's, it's what we use soft. to tie the trees to the racks, don't it? Uh, the garden center yeah because it doesn't rub um off the bark it's really soft on the bark i mean i don't think that it's good to you know rub indefinitely mm -hmm. like i don't know that you want to keep it on there forever that's why yeah. i'm kind of hopeful that maybe in like a year two that they'll just harden vertical yeah. and i can cut it yeah so i don't know but um see what happens yeah it, do it i'll see if i can find a link next video is setting up a new new hose link and planting lilacs and snapdragons so that was the last thing that we wanted to make sure Alyssa had for her her new garden space was a hose that was easy and that's the perfect application because you, know, you have the yard to pull the hose out yeah oh like, yeah it's the perfect spot for one of those so we just showed you how to put one of those together and we when we came home we showed you the different ways that we have installed ours you know in a in a pipe um, on a wall, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I did plant lilacs, some uh, President Lincoln lilacs. I need one more, and the garden center was out. Mm, uh. It's gonna be until next year. 
And then uh, snapdragons, I got those planted in the cut flower garden. Susan said, when training those lilacs to tree forms, do you have to maintain and trim off the small branches under the desired canopy? Yes. Or does the tree stop forming branches down low over time? Nope. It'll still, it'll still form them. Like our old ones that we have that are more tree form, I have to go in, I need to go in. Especially on that purple one by the, the fireplace. Mm -hmm. It's got suckers all mm. over it. And you just got to go in there a couple of times. Do you, have any of you been here long enough to remember when I tackled that initially? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. It was kind of scary. It was... I thought, I don't know how much of this lilac is going to be left because there was so much dead in it mm -hmm. and it was so thick with suckers and there was ropes. There was like, but it was um, not the right kind of rope. Oh. It was like rope and there was chain. Really? Like somebody got intense chain. with this lilac at one point and I thought, oh, I don't know what I'm in for here and what is going to be left. But training that or trimming that rather into a tree form, getting rid of all that undergrowth was such a, a lift to that space. But I still have to go in a couple of times a year and clean it out. Jill said, when do you begin to spray supertunias? As soon as they are planted? Pretty much. And that's a weekly chore as well. Mm -hmm. So fertilizing on Tuesdays, budworm spray on another day, and then there's usually a weed spray day, like gravel, in the gravel, weed spray day. Those are the three weekly chores that we do around here. Uh, Jane said, how heavy duty is the hose on the hose link? It must be very pliable, so I'm wondering how it holds up over several years. Well, you guys know how much we use our hoses around here. Um, our oldest one is... How old? Several years at this point. Yeah. So I don't think that we've ever had it. We've had, we have a lot of hose links. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've ever had one give out. I did one time have a hose link that leaked right when I got it. Oh. And I, I contacted them. Now, like also keep in mind, like we've paid, we've bought the vast majority, majority of our hose links. They've uh -huh. given us a couple, uh -huh. two or three maybe. And we've bought um, like. But we have like 25. So we've bought the majority of them because mm -hmm. we like them. Yeah. But I, they didn't know that it was Garden Answer like messaging. Mm -hmm. It was just a uh, Aaron, you mm -hmm. know. So I mean, I suppose if they put the connection together, but I'm guessing most people wouldn't because we don't share our last name. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just emailed them and was like, "Hey, I got a leaky one," and they were like, "Just keep it. If you can fix it, great. We'll send you a new one." So um, I, I don't remember if Paul. I think he used it for parts oh, really? because we we um, were being hard on one with the gator and we bent a piece oh. <laughs> our fault yeah <laughs> so it was the little uh the metal piece the uh, aluminum piece that comes out the bottom oh, yeah. uh -huh. and so i think what we did is since that one was broken we took just, that out yeah used it as parts nice to have a part model yeah <laughs> sitting somewhere cynthia said love the fountain can you and or Alyssa do a tutorial on how to make it i would love to have a hose link yeah so Alyssa made a beautiful fountain in her greenhouse um, in an urn. She said she tried out so many different pots and reservoirs to try to find which one would, would work to where she could still plant some flowers. So it's just like, um, we've done videos of it's been a long time since I've done a fountain in a pot. Since the beginning. Like a long time. That was like one of our first five videos. Was it really? Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you know, you take your pot and put soil in it and then you sink your water reservoir in there, making sure that your soil is below the lip of that. And then you've got like rocks and stuff in your reservoir just to build up. And you could have your pump at the bottom with a tube that goes up to the top rock. Then you just kind of like arrange rocks around that tube so that it just all goes back down into that reservoir. And then you still have a little room around it to plant things. And I think it turned out so cute. Oh, I love it. And the sound is perfect in there. Alberta said, is, uh, as Hoselink is an Australian company, is this open to Aussies? Oh, uh, the giveaway. Uh, I don't think so because there's, uh, yes, they're from Australia, but they also have Holds Link USA and in the U S they can own, like it's, I think their marketing department is different. I know they sell different products in, in Australia versus the U S. So mm -hmm. I believe that they can only ship to, I mean, anyone can enter, but mm -hmm. they, they can only ship the prize within the U S. Mm -hmm. Connor said, if the door to the composter was upside down, why is the logo now upside down? Because the logo comes separately. It comes with all the screws and stuff to put it together. And then it's got an adhesive. You take the adhesive off and slap it on if you want to. And I thought it kind of looks pretty, like that mm -hmm. little gold emblem. It's kind of a pretty little like jewel, I guess, on mm -hmm. it. So when we had finished the initial construction of the compost bin, even though it was wrong, I didn't know it at the time, I put the logo on it. And so then when we flipped it, of course, it was upside down at that point. But I don't want to wreck the adhesive. Yeah. So, I mean, you could peel it off at this point if, if you wanted to. Deborah said, I know you always use Biotone for planting, but it is not always available in large sizes in our area. Is it okay to use Plant Tone when setting plants? Yes. It's totally fine. 
Can you set up the hose link farther from the water source slash faucet? Is there an extender for that? Um, yeah. Just hose, yeah. right? Just hook it up to a lead, another hose. We have for our high tunnel out there with the plants that we have for other projects hanging out, uh, the hose link leader hose is only, I, I don't know, what, eight six feet, feet or six feet? Five, six feet. Is it? I mean, it's meant to be close to, to a the faucet. faucet. That makes the most amount of sense. So uh, we hooked another hose to it and ran it over to the nearest faucet. Um, and that worked out great. Still use the hose link, but it reaches away further. Sue said, anyone else wondering how Laura got out of the composter? Oh, Aaron just lifted it right over the top of me. Just whoop and took it off. It's pretty lightweight. Uh, next video is planting our big pots with annuals for full sun. That was a fun video because it's been a while since we've like, taken a look back. Mm -hmm. So we did plant up the 10 big pots on our east fence line. And then I just sat and went through the years because that's the seventh time I've planted it mm -hmm. along that fence line. And it was, it was just fun to revisit those and just talk about some of the combinations that have worked well, what we've learned and that sort of thing. Mealsinator said, I look forward to seeing the plants grow. Are there pansies that can get to the size of the pink flowers you grow that take over? Pfft, no, not that I know of. Cheryl said, how much of your pot do you fill with the newer soil? Top quarter, quarter? Um, on those pots, it was probably the top half. I would guess. Yeah, the soil that was in there, it wasn't too well, it's bad. Well, because it was fresh last year. Mm, um, no, I think for, for bulb planting, we usually like to do on huge pots, we might leave the bottom soil like forever and just top, you know, top it up with fresh stuff. But in most pots, I like to um, freshen it. I like to have fresh soil every you know year, if possible. I used to be diligent. Every time we, we repotted potted stuff member, I would mm -hmm. get rid of the soil. And then I just started to think like, okay, these annuals are not as deep rooted. Like if you can pull the root out, ball out and they haven't reached the soil down below, like they may have sucked up some of the nutrients from it, but I can add some biotone in there, right. recharge it a bit and then add fresh stuff on top of that. And we've had fine luck with that. So long as there hasn't been an, an insect issue, in that case, you get rid of the soil. Iggy said, wondering specifically how long your drip runs for each time and how much water is released. Understand everyone's climate is different, but trying to gauge how long watering by hand should take. So we're running it every day right now in those pots, I think for 20 minutes. Uh -huh. Do you remember how many emitters? 10. So 10 emitters, they do a half gallon per hour. Okay. So do the math. Okay. I'll do it. Actually, each one is 0. 0.4, I think, gallons per hour, just to make it even more complicated. <laughs> Four gallons an hour. Mm-hmm. So four gallons. So it's two gallons in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's like one and a half gallons of water-ish. Wow, it doesn't minutes. seem like a lot. Well, right now it's not that hot. Yeah, we, yeah, and that's the thing yeah. is we'll probably up it, mm -hmm. you know, as I mean, as the root balls right on. now are only this big, but right. eventually, you know, especially when the sweet potato vine has a lot more leaf canopy to support, yeah. it'll need a lot more water. So, uh, yeah, I might get to the point where we're doing it twice a day if it's like over 100 degrees for, you know, an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. or, or I might go, it's a large reservoir, yeah. so it'll hold on to more moisture. Mm -hmm. So I might just up it to like 30 minutes or 40 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, just double the amount of time if it's, if it gets hot. Yeah. Dahlia said, can you tell me where you order your proven winners from? I've ordered twice from two different places and both times have arrived at my doorstep looking terrible. We get most of ours from a fairly local grower. Yeah. So we don't order ours in the same way. Like they don't get shipped to us. Not in it's boxes. The we order it the same way that a garden center would order it. Uh -huh. Because if you, if you get things in large enough quantities, you know, through the garden center and we have connections that way. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's different. I don't really know what to suggest there because we just don't have a lot of experience ordering from anywhere. So if you like order that. from provenwinners.com, it's coming from Michigan. Mm -hmm. If you order from... We have received stuff from them though before and had yeah. it look really good. That yeah, comes out of Garden Crossings. Any... Yeah. Yeah. In Michigan. And they do a good job packaging. But um, it is expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. The plants Well, the are, idea is not to... Yeah, they're they, not trying to... They encourage you to go to your local garden center, but like if you don't have that option, that's just, it's just a convenience. But shipping plants is a total pain. <laughs> it's like, I'm glad I don't have to do it. Yeah. Because, I mean, making sure the soil stays in and the branches don't get broken and they don't get stuck in transit and not with, with no water, you know, it's such a... I know a couple of years ago, a lot of garden centers stopped carrying proven winners um, because they didn't want to use the white pot which made it slightly more expensive. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to use the Proven Winners branded container. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's mostly died off, although there are still a lot of garden centers that are, you know, still kind of mad at Proven Winners for doing mm -hmm. that. 
to me, that was just a normal marketing decision. Yeah. Like they knew they would have some. Yeah, everybody markets their yeah. stuff. Like imagine going to the store and buying like, you know, Jif peanut butter, and it wasn't labeled Jif. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That'd be weird. Would it? That'd be super weird. Imagine a little white label that says, like, handwritten, that says, Jif peanut butter. Yeah. And it's a completely unlabeled, and like, just a like, jar is this really or Jif something. You're butter? like, yeah, so where did this come That's from true. exactly? <laughs> you'd, yeah. you'd be suspect, like, to the max, and you'd yeah. pick something else. Yeah. So. A little skippy in your car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Instead. You'd be getting skippy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Main Blaine said, I love the large pots. What's the secret to having pots that don't freeze and crack in the winter? Take them in. <laughs> I guess, yeah. There's really... We are a zone you six. You cover them, right? You can cover them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we are a zone six. We keep our concrete out for the winter. I mean, as you know. I think and... it's just if it if it if you get the freeze thaw too much. Sure. If it gets really cold, like it gets rainy and then freezes, mm-hmm. that's just kind of a recipe for disaster. I think gotcha. covering them is really your... Covering or bring them in... Is it? Is it? Melissa said, "Isn't there a purple fountain grass without the purple? I don't just don't like the color. I need the vigor and height, but in bright and green. You could try the skyrocket penicetum. It's like a white and green. It's a real pretty one. It doesn't grow quite as quickly as this the uh, purple fountain grass. Um, and there's lots of other perennial grasses, but nothing performs quite like that purple fountain grass. But I can understand, you know, if you just don't care for that color, you kind of want that same structure, but." There's other, there's perennial penicetums too, like Desert Plains is a really beautiful one. Uh, oh, the lemon squeeze, now not, not in a pot, a container application probably because they do, they're kind of wide and a little bit more like arching blades of grass that go down. But the lemon squeeze penicetum that I planted last year is so pretty in the garden right now. It's just this bright chartreuse and it just pops, I love it. You could also try a pompous grass. You, one could. One could do that. Carol said, what in the world do you feed them? Do you deadhead? I know the drip is key, but mine never stay in full bloom and look so healthy. Um, we feed ours, the liquid fertilizer from Proven Winners, with the, it has the addition of the chelated EDDHA iron. We add extra too, actually. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. So in order to keep those leaves nice and deep green, that weekly consistency with fertilizer and consistent water is what keeps them looking nice. And a lot of people have to trim theirs in the middle of summer because they get leggy. I mean, there's an occasion where occasionally we'll have to do it. Yeah, I always find that interesting when people talk about trimming. I mean, I get if you're trying to keep the size, like, you know, if you want to see the container, Mm -hmm. I get that because they do kind of cover the container. Mm -hmm. But if you're staying on it with spraying to where bugs aren't getting it, you know, like budworms aren't eating the blooms. And they have enough food to be robust and thick. Yeah. There's not as much need. Tell you what though, consistent, like having a drip system, having consistent water, that's probably number one. Uh, And deadheading, no. We don't have to deadhead any of those super tunias, uh, super bina, super bells. Um, The only thing I put in containers typically that need to be deadheaded are geraniums. And I don't put that in very many containers. I have a whole bunch of the green to uh, plant. I planted out the bullseye salmon recently. You'll see that in a video here soon. I gave my mother-in-law like 50 some geraniums. I don't care. <laughs> Take all this. She took all the maverick coral and scarlets and your sister sent me a picture and she's like, I got some of the extras. Mm. And she planted up some for her hanging baskets with them. Um, but they were like super bright, brightly colored, like a little bit, um, a little bit more on the orange side. So the maverick coral and scarlet, I probably will not start from seed again. Um, but I'm glad to have found them new homes. But I have a lot of the apple blossom and quicksilver still left in there that are really pretty. And um, pink. I did pink. There's one other color in there. They're all in the pink family, though. Rosemary and Time said, fun look back over the years. I could have sworn that you and Aaron did the plant competition two years in a row. Uh, was it large pots placed elsewhere on the property for the second year? The, the second time we did the competition was at the church. It was still in those true drop containers, but it was after we had replaced them with the concrete ones here. We took those down. In fact, I just texted your mom this morning. I'm like, Mm. are they ready? We can come plant them anytime. Uh, And the last video from this week was planting new surefire white begonias in the landscape. And this is another video where we took a look back because this was the fifth time Mm -hmm. planting under those trees. And it's changed. The area has changed so dramatically. The first year we planted the snowdrift, I think, right? And we planted six of those and they mm-hmm. totally filled in the, the area, but those boxwoods were so little. Everything and the arbs were so little. It looks so different now. And we have so much more shade there now. Thank you, Jesus. There's shade there yeah. now. Um, but that changes what you're able to plant. And the surefire rose begonias did so great for us there last year. I mean, 
they don't need to be fertilized, no deadheading. They look good all season long. Like that's the plant you want to put in. So when they came out with the Surefire White, when I found out they were coming out with that color, I was so excited because I was just going to plant the rose, Surefire Rose again. Cause I'm like, this is a, like a baller plant and it yeah. does so great for us. And I'm like, why mess with a good thing? Finding something that can do both sun and shade when you've got such differing light can be really difficult. So they're tiny. <laughs> They're so little right now. I'm hoping they grow like the surefire rose. Mm -hmm. I have every hope that they will. And I think that now that it's a lot more shady there, I'll like the white a lot more mm -hmm. because it'll it'll really shine. Moon garden. Well, ish. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I'll like it more because there's so much purple and pink right behind it now in the mm -hmm. flower bed. Lisa said, love the white pop in more shaded gardens. Can you talk about your gravel driveway? How often do you deal with any weeds starting to grow? I feel like we need to do another video about that because we get questions like all the time about yeah. the weeds we spray them in the gravel driveway <laughs> dead weed brew highest mixed ratio every week once a week if you can get stuff get weeds when they're tiny uh-huh it's so much less work yeah like that's why you just do it every week infinitely less work yeah don't wait till it's a problem like just go out there even if you're hitting 10 weeds that's yeah. 10 less weeds that will be huge the next time you go out there and then there'll be a new crop coming in you, you can know, spend right so much them. less time on it once a week mm -hmm. versus it gets out of control and then you just give up yeah you're like oh i'm do done it. yeah bridget said what would happen if you space the seedlings closer i didn't and thought it will look just fuller am i wrong should i pull some also i've watched you since day one and have learned so much and now have a garden i never would have known to how to achieve. That is so fun to hear. I'm so glad. Um, I wouldn't pull them. I mean, if I had more, I'd probably pull, put them all close together. Just, just pack that thing out. Sometimes though, especially when we're showing you in video, like you kind of want to see the potential of a plant. So spacing them out further, like look who's talking right now. Like yeah. that doesn't sound like something I would say, but it's true. Like um, a case in point was your one pot, one plant per pot project. Mm -hmm planting just one plant in a pot and seeing how or it Or really does. the first year we did snowdrift. You planted six snowdrift right. in that area. And it totally, and filled, it totally in. filled in. Yeah. I'd have a hard time doing that even now. Yeah. I, I think I had to really kind of rein I you in. I think you did. Yeah. You were like, those are going to Because they were small snowdrift too. Yeah. They were like under developed at yeah. the time that you planted them. Right. Uh, Noelle said, these white begonias look like sunny side up eggs. They do. Are there any fuchsia or lavender begonias? Not in that series. There's surefire rose, white, cherry cordial, and red. We planted some cherry cordials at the college yesterday. I'm excited to see how those grow. Beth said, love the begonia recommendation. I have an area that needs those. Do you have a link to or recommendation for the watering wand you used? It's the dram watering wand. How long Amazon. are those? Um, there's a short, a shorty and a long one. Yeah, so, the long ones are most helpful for us. Uh, I know my mom's got a few short ones that she likes to use at home. It depends on the application. Um, you might be able to find them at your local garden center. I know my parents carry them at their garden center. Um, you can also order them online. But um, oftentimes I will switch out the diffuser on the end. The ones that are out in the landscape, I just leave the normal one that comes with them. And then I swap the diffuser for ones that have way more holes that are tiny. So that's a really soft spray in the greenhouse. Last question, with all the hard work and effort your family is putting into your homestead, will you have it preserved as a sightseeing slash visiting garden in the future? Maybe when we're not here anymore. Yeah, maybe. No plans for that at the moment. Awesome. That's it for today, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Nature's Willow, for sponsoring today's video. And we will see you in the next one.